at uh, this uh, passage um, and uh, this, this idea uh, behind uh, this is the way. And uh, as I said, there's a Mandalorian kind of uh, song to all of this. But it, it, it actually uh, tells us uh, that people are searching for the way to go. Our first song today talked about many searching for answers. And uh, often, quite often, um, they discover a, a ways down that road that actually it's the, the wrong way. And uh, uh, that's what repentance is, isn't it? To say, the way I've been going really is the wrong way. I need to turn around to repent uh, and to uh, follow a better way, a way that Jesus Christ has provided. And so over these uh, next uh, few weeks leading up to Easter, we're going to look at the various aspects of what it is to be people of the way, of uh, how Jesus pointed to a way, uh, a new and living way that we can actually live and, uh, and influence the world around us uh, for the sake of the gospel and for, uh, for the increase of the love of God. Um, this idea of the way or the people of the way comes from uh, both the Old and New Testament. Uh, for those who, who know uh, sort of a little bit of history around the Bible, they know that the early Jewish Christians, those who were Jews who became Christians or Christ followers, were often referred to or referred to themselves as people of the way. Uh, it probably came way back from Isaiah chapter 40 where the prophet said, prepare the way of the Lord. Um, and other Jews had called themselves the Nazarenes because Jesus was from Nazareth, uh, while other Jewish uh, Christian sects called themselves the Ebionites, which literally means the poor. And so very much right from the inception of the church, those who followed Christ were known as people of the way, the Nazarenes, uh, even the Ebionites, the poor. But we know that in the story of the church, in the, gospel, sorry, in the book of Acts, a church was formed, the ecclesia, the gathered, that's what we're part of right now. And the church was formed and founded on the day that we now know as the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. And tradition holds that the first Gentile church, in other words, those who became followers of Jesus who were not from a Jewish background, were founded in a place called Antioch. And you read about that in Acts chapter 11. And it's recorded that the disciples of Jesus, people of the way, were first called Christians, which means little Christs. In other words, they were the followers of the Christ. So with all that context, we're learning what it is in our context in 2020, whatever it is, uh, to follow after Jesus Christ and to be followers of that same way. Now, regardless of our, I suppose, um, tags or, uh, or affiliations or backgrounds and all that sort of stuff, essentially Christians are people who have committed their life after acknowledging they've been going the wrong way, following after Jesus' way, but have then committed their life to following after Jesus Christ. And that's been happening for over 2,000 years. So ideas come and go, empires rise and fall, ideologies change and fall. But the thing has remained over 2,000 years is this commitment of people to follow the way of Jesus Christ. Now that's a miracle in itself, isn't it? That in 2022, that's right, we would be sitting here together still declaring that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. You think of everything that has risen and fallen over those 2,000 years, just even think of the last 50 years, but 2,000 years. But the thing that remains is that people like us and people nothing like us follow after Jesus. That astounds me. That's a miracle in itself. Things that are not true do not last that long, you know, in my opinion anyway. So we ask God to renew our minds through the word of God and we fill them with his word so that we can understand what it is to follow after the way. That's what we're doing right now. We live this isolated living, this individual life, and we then attach ourselves to community, which is church, so that we know that together we can walk this journey with greater haste and greater integrity. It's a wonderful thing. So that's what we're going to be looking at the next six weeks leading up to the events of Easter. Following Jesus like his disciples. Not following Jesus like the fractions and you know, titles that come along, but as followers of Jesus. Now, you may think that we make all this up sometimes, but we've got a basic strategy, the way we do things, and it fits into this uh, up an in and out strategy. You just want to spend a moment on that. The up strategy means that our relationship with God 
is primary. So we love God with all we have. We love God, we love God. Heart, soul, mind, strength, all that stuff. And so we feed our lives with the things of God, his word, his people, worship, all that disciplines of discipleship. And then that means that we can have these good and hopefully healthy relationships inward. You know, one of the things that the data has shown through COVID is the increase of people leaving gatherings or gathered church right throughout the world and will be the same in Australia. But the other thing that has been attached to that is the rise of division amongst gatherings of Christians. There is division amongst Christians unlike there has ever been before. So our relationship up really, really affects our relationship in. I find when I'm in a good relationship with God, I seem to be in a better relationship with people around me. And then we have the out strategy. When we're healthy upwards and inwards, we have something to offer this world. The love of God, the good news of the gospel. Well, that's our strategy. And when we look at the creation of the church in the New Testament, we see that people were called by God to this same way, to live this way, to learn this way and to invite other people in to this way of living. So today we're going to kick that off with a, a word uh, that we looked at on Tuesday because what we're doing at Tuesday at Explorers is we're looking at kind of the theme before the Sunday uh, and we looked at a, a word that um, sounds fairly uh, bland in, 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 in a sense uh, but it's invaluable to the people of the way. It's a, it's a hard word, it's the word called accountability. I want to start this series by looking at this word because this word is very important for us as individuals and particularly as a, as a church community. Um, to sort of illustrate that, uh, imagine that you're on, a, on, a, on the parkway and it's chaos. Because often chaos on the parkway, I made the mistake of going on the parkway at about quarter past eight the other morning and I forgot because for two years uh, it's just been me and somebody else, that's it, you know. But this is jam-packed and it only takes one accident for, uh, for that parkway just to seize up in either direction. But imagine you're on the parkway and uh, people are driving badly, way worse than you're driving. And they're speeding and they're weaving in and out of traffic and they're cutting each other off. They're texting on their cell phones or their, their mobile phones. Very important things uh, that you have to talk about on your phone, but they are talking about rubbish on their phones. Uh, they're getting distracted. They're getting angry. They're um, making non-faith based gestures to each other. Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of chaos on the parkway. And there's all this free-for-all going on, but then something happens on the parkway that changes some of the behaviour. <laughs> there is another vehicle that goes on the parkway. And suddenly, people slow down, phones get put away, fingers get retracted, speech becomes corrected. Why is that? Accountability. And every time I would hope that we get behind the wheel of a car, we are accountable, not only to those in our car, including ourselves, but to those around us. Accountability is a word I've grown to love, but I used to hate. But accountability is a big part of being a disciple, a person of the way. The reality is that we're always accountable for the lives we lead. Even in the backdrop of the excuses we come up with, or I do at least. In Genesis, in the beginning, God created human beings. It wasn't exactly like that, but this is the kind of gist of the story. Uh, God says that they are not to eat from one tree, and the man and the woman, they violate this. And there, there is pause in the story. And we wonder what will happen next. Maybe God will not notice. Maybe God is so busy running the universe that he'll let that slide. But God does notice and he asks them a few questions. He says, why are you hiding? Who told you that you were naked and why did you eat from that forbidden tree? He's inviting the man and the woman into accountability. Still is, in fact. But the man says, it was the woman you gave me whose idea was that woman. It wasn't my idea, it was your idea, God, her fault. She's accountable. God says to the, the woman, well, what have you done? And the woman says, well, you created that serpent. It was the serpent's fault. He's accountable. So God pronounces the consequences of their actions, but he still loves the man and the woman, but he holds them accountable even though he loves them. See, sometimes we think being held accountable is an act not of love. Who else will God 
hold accountable. Well, this is very consistent throughout the uh, whole of the Old and New Testament that fundamentally we as human beings are accountable to a much higher power than our own. I put that in dramatic red so you'd see that. So then each of us will give an account of himself or herself or themselves to God. It's clear, it's very uncomfortable for us to look at that sometimes because we would like to hold everybody else accountable. But we're accountable. Each of us will give an account of himself. Now, notice to whom and for whom we all give account. You don't stand before God and give an account for me. I don't stand before God and give an account for you. We all must stand before God and give an account of ourselves. It's all over the New Testament. And there's no creature hidden from sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So there's no hiding from the one who sees it all. That's why it's so ridiculous to try and hide from God. When my daughter Lydia was a little girl, which was 27 years ago, 25 years ago, she used to play hide and seek like this. This is how she used to play, right? We're going to play hide and seek, Lydia, what are you going to do? And she used to stand in plain view and do that. So her idea was that if she couldn't see anybody else, they couldn't see her. And we play those games with God all the time, don't we? We say, well, God, you can't see what I'm doing. Of course God can see what we're doing. And he loves us. But notice to whom and for whom we give an account. Even further than that, in our digital age, we think we have to only give account for the verbal things that come out of our mouth. Well, well no, we're, we're actually accountable for everything we do. I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Do you think it's imaginable that people text empty words? Well, sometimes those devices don't feel like they're under the same accountability as the things we speak. There's a great rule with uh, technology. If you're not prepared to say something out of your mouth, then don't type it. It's not a great saying, it doesn't rhyme or anything, but that's a good <laughs> way to live, okay? So we all got to give an account. To whom and for whom? To God for ourselves. All that we've done, all that we've said, all that we've thought, because we are accountable to God. There was a famous statement, a statesman, a guy called Daniel Webster, who you may or may not know. He was once asked, what is the most profound thought that has ever entered your mind? Now, Daniel, I must admit, wasn't a guy I want to hang out with, but here's what he said. He said, the most important thought that has ever occupied my mind is that of my individual responsibility to God. In other words, I'm accountable. So whatever people think of me, However people like me or dislike me, how much money I make, how much money I don't make, what I've got, what I don't have, where I've been, where I haven't been, is of no consequence to me other or higher than my accountability to God. Now, there's a lot of stuff that we are accountable for, but there's a lot of stuff we're not. I'm not accountable and you're not accountable for the suffering that others inflict upon ourselves. We're not accountable for the family that we're born into. We're not accountable for our genetic structure. Some of that is just completely out of our hands. But what I am is accountable to God. And we live in this very therapeutic uh, culture that tends to focus more on the outside forces that affect our behaviour. You know, they did that, so I did this. Well, the impact of this is that you don't often hear people talk about the dimension of accountability or personal accountability. In fact, it's precisely because God loves us and values our personhood and our, even our little kingdoms that he gives us the dignity of being accountable before him. So when we often use this word accountability in a negative way, we think of somebody accountable or somebody being accountable to somebody and getting them uh, into trouble, I suppose, or us getting into trouble. And from that perspective of Jesus, his community is a way in which we are able to, um, uh, to be accountable to one another and accountable before God. I, I was uh, listening to uh, a news thing about uh, the most popular songs at funerals. That's what I do. And uh, they, there's about four or five different songs that people play. But by far, the, the, the most popular song played at a funeral, at the end of the funeral, you know, when they're taking the coffin out or lying the coffin down, in a non-religious setting is, what do you think? Yeah, that's right. Sinatra is my way. Or Paul Anker's my way, but Sinatra's Anker. Yeah, that, all that. 
Regrets, I've had a few, but too few to mention I did it my way. It's become like the bravado, it's like the, the captain of my soul, the invictus of our generation, isn't it? I think third was always look on the bright side of life, uh, but on it goes, it was a stupid list. Accountability to God is actually a great gift. What I used to see as a great burden, I now can see as a great gift. Because when we are open before God and before each other, we understand that God is a God of grace and a God of love and that his anger or his frustration with us becomes more apparent when we try to hide. And there's a risk in not hiding because you become known. Because you become known not because just of the great things you, that you do and are, but you become known perhaps of some of the challenging things that you know and are. But when people of God become accountable to God and to one another, then there is a transparency and an honesty that overtakes a lot of the nonsense that goes along with the human experience. That we don't need to wear religious masks in order to gain one another's acceptance. That we are accepted because God has accepted us and we have some empathy and sympathy for those who are struggling perhaps with the same things we're struggling with. This is all over the New Testament, to be people of the way. And so a bit later on in the service, we're going to have a look at some of the practicalities of that, just a few of them, so that we can perhaps get some traction on what it is to be people of the way. So people of the way lean into accountability, primarily their accountability before God, but also an accountability to one another. Um, and I thought we'd just look at a couple of things that might help us to hang some of that idea on. Uh, the first one really is to acknowledge, even though it doesn't always seem like this, but that life is better together than it is alone. And accountability helps us to do with others what we wouldn't do by ourselves. That's why we do have 
church in groups and stuff like that because it keeps us accountable, I guess, that we can come. Not so that we can mark off a role and say, tick, you were here, aren't you a, a good person and the person who hasn't come isn't a good person. But it's just easy to drift out of things. See? And so groups and connection and church and all that sort of stuff that we do is a way in which we can be accountable and helpful to one another. See, God has given each of us who are Christ followers, Christians, a gift, a gift of the Holy Spirit. And uh, for us to bury that and hide it and keep it to ourselves is not in any way the intention of giving the gift. The gift was always for the common good. And if we are not together, then we can't bring to the common good, that which God has placed in our hands. So accountability helps to do with others what we would not do by ourselves. Uh, God knows it all. He knows all about our work and our dreams and our fears and our struggles and our egos and our failures and our little resentments and all that sort of stuff we have. He knows about all the details of your financial life uh, more than you do. Uh, He knows it all. He knows and has access to all your accounts. He has access to all of your movements. He has access to all the things you do and don't do. Now, that can be scary if you have a posture towards God that is this angry God that just wants to punish you. He knows all about our life. He knows about my commitments, my relationship with my spouse and my kids. And he knows about all of that. He knows all of it. He he knows all of it. Uh, Paul, the apostle, wrote to a young pastor called Timothy to help hold him accountable to his calling and to his commitments. And he puts it like this. He says, Timothy, train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness. Now, just pause there. Physical training is of some value. It is a valuable thing to our bodies, our minds, our disposition to get regular physical training. Now, that doesn't mean to go sign up for a gym. It means it might be go for a walk. There is value in that. There's some value in keeping this temple of the Holy Spirit in reasonable shape. There is some value in physical training. But godliness, to be people of the way, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. That little sign you see up is in a lot of gyms that I drive past. It says your worst workout session with a partner is better than your best session by yourself. Now I wonder why that is. Well, in a gym context or a training context, people will work and pursue a greater level of capacity and goal when they're training with others. God knows it all. But godliness is a value in all things. It means to become the kind of person God has created us to be, uh, having the kind of joy and the kind of love and integrity that characterises the divine. This is a trustworthy saying, says the Scriptures, and deserves full acceptance. So we need to train ourselves. We need to be about the disciplines of discipleship. We will crave accountability because we know we're better with it, better together, than alone. We need to be challenged and encouraged for someone to say, keep going, or I'll help you up, encourage you. In the New Testament, friendships of accountability or mutual encouragement, confession or admiration um, are an indispensable vehicle for uh, the training in godliness. Uh, that's why a lot of us have got uh, mentor relationships. For instance, in, in, in my, uh, uh, my life, I mentor two young pastors who are starting out uh, in, in ministry, God bless them, and, uh, and I meet with them and, uh, because I've been a little bit further down the road and I, uh, I'm able to hopefully bring some, okay, this will happen, but let's, let's get through that and uh, get to the other side of it. But I myself uh, am in a few accountability relationships as well, that at least once a fortnight I meet with a person and uh, we talk through all the things that are uh, on the plate, some good, some bad, some ugly. Um, So I don't want you to think that I'm promoting this without practising it. I have no right to do that. We're also called in scriptures to confess our sins to one another and pray for each other so that we may be healed. So the intention is that we become a, a fuller, more godly community because of accountability. But that depends on our posture. Here's the second thing. We invite accountability rather than endure it. 
If you, like me, had this attitude to accountability that it was an intrusion to your privacy, then you're going to struggle as I struggled for too many years. But if you invite it in rather than endure it, it brings about peace. Now, uh, on Tuesdays, we, we looked at this great scripture for, for a fair while where it says, let us consider, consider, let's think up all the ways that we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Now, we understood that the word spur means to stir up. Uh, you remember that great old Australian idiom about uh, oh, that bloke's a stirrer? Uh, well, that's the idea. You can either stir people up for good or you can stir people up for bad. Well, in the Christian context, we're called to spur one another. We're called to stir one another up. In other words, say, let's keep going together. I know it's hard. I know it's a season of difficulty, but let's keep moving forward. Um, if somebody wants to, to do you wrong, they'll, uh, or probably if, if somebody wants to do wrong, and it's true of my life, we will find a way to do wrong. We're all pretty good at sneaking around. But real accountability is the kind that really works when it is, rather than enforced, it is invited. When we have a genuine desire to grow in some area. Because if we don't, we drift. Would you check in with me? Would you give me some feedback? Would you be honest? Would you ask me how I am really? It's a little humbling to begin with, but it's so empowering. So we need to invite it rather than to endure it. The other dynamic of accountability is it takes a lot of courage. That's what encouragement means, to bring courage to one another. So we need to encourage. It takes a lot of courage to hold to one, uh, to, to, to be accountable uh, for the life we lead. The opposite is true. Without encouragement, I think we die. You know, in the New Testament, Paul, the apostle, talked about a time when Peter, the apostle, was guilty of legalism. Uh, when uh, Paul, when, sorry, when Peter, uh, I'm very tempted to say Mary because I've got a lot of Peter and Paul in my head, uh, but uh, when Peter became a Christian from a Jewish context, um, one of the things that Peter found really hard to let go of was a lot of the requirements around being a Jew, particularly around diet and stuff like that. And so he was saying to those young Christians, yeah, it's fine to understand that Jesus is your saviour, but in addition to that, you need to abstain from this or do that or wash this or do it you know, in that way. So he's trying to blend the two. And Paul, the apostle, had to confront him to hold him accountable because the gospel was not about that because the old way had died and the new way had come. And later in that story, uh, the Bible tells us that later when Peter, the apostle, came to Antioch, Paul says, I had a face-to-face -face confrontation with him because he was clearly in the wrong. Now, can you imagine how much courage it would take for Paul, who's a relatively newcomer to Christianity, in fact, was the promoter of trying to eradicate Christianity before he became a Christian. Can you imagine the courage it would take for Paul to go to Peter, the apostle, one of the original twelve, and to say, Peter, you have this wrong. Sometimes it takes courage to be accountable. To not just hold another accountable, but to receive that in the spirit in which we should. We're told that Peter did receive that and he corrected his behaviour. But it also takes some risk. Paul taught the followers of Jesus that whatever we do, to work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for human masters. And that's the posture that we live our lives. It takes a lot of courage to be accountable. And people of the way ought to remember that we are accountable to God and to each other. And God is much more interested in what we are doing rather than what we're avoiding. It seems to me Christianity, when I was a kid, seemed to be all the things you couldn't do. Christians don't, Christians don't, Christians don't, Christians don't. Well, perhaps it's time that we concentrate on what Christians should be about. Christians do, Christians do, Christians do. Christians are about the things of the kingdom of God. And God has placed in our hands whatever he has placed in our hands and we're accountable for that. And so that great and wonderful and quite confronting question comes to us all. What did you do with what you've been given? Did I bury it? Did I use it? Did I expand it? Did I embrace it? Did I ignore it? Did I whinge all my life that I didn't have more? 
or do I be about the kingdom of God? Am I accountable? Well, each of us are accountable before God. And if we want to live as people of the way, followers as Jesus followers follow after him, then we've got to get our heads around this accountability thing. 